Thank you for the invite uh, to talk about a topic that is somewhat counterintuitive in large and formal. But I'll share some so thought on telling you on how things might be changing. So when you look at the uh, treatment of heme malignancies, particularly lymphoid malignancies, lymphomas, and um, ALL, we used to treat them many, of them, many of them the same way, very aggressively, including large cell lymphoma, sometimes treated for a very long time. Follicular lymphoma, then the NSO was treated two or three years, years ago. And then, obviously, the only disease that we still use the maintenance using conventional cytotoxic is ALL and lymphoblastic lymphoma. Any other disease, because we have achieved better results of the induction, we have sort of over time given up. And then this is revisited constantly uh, when we sort of max out our results with the induction therapy. So interferon story, for example, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, in inolent lymphoma and abandoned once we had rituxin. And then we know that this has some momentum now. For example, published data recently in metal cell lymphoma, where we know now that even in, after high dose therapy and transplant, rituximab maintenance improves the... Uh, reduces the risk of recurrence and improves the survival. So why this would work in large cell lymphoma? Well, the failures occur early, even in the CR patients. As you can see, 80% of the failures occur in the first 18 months. But on the other hand, if you reach EFS 24, you have this with very few relapse, 5 to 7% afterwards, and the same survival as the rest of the population. So the strategy is to go beyond our CHOP actually have so far uh, failed, and there's many other trials combining our CHOP plus X, hopefully that will be improving in some subtypes of lymphoma. But intensive therapy, we heard from John, those are just said our EPAC has not been superior to our CHOP, so we are still, CHOP, our CHOP is the standard of care. But we have now the ability to look at MRD and residual disease that actually correlate very much with the outcome in large cell lymphoma. And on the left, this is actually the reduction of the clonal DNA after two cycles that correlates enormously with the outcome. And on the right, this is actually the um, patient that I follow that are constantly MRD negative that do really well regardless of the RPI. And the patient obviously that have detectable that do very poorly. This is all a way that, uh, also a way that you can potentially monitor and maybe in the future replace imaging, this is being looked at. But maybe this is also a target to maybe some kind of intervention in the future. The mentoring strategies in large cell lymphoma include antibodies, biological agents, and then immune-based therapies. So this was first looked at in the um, SWAT, the ECAR trial of 4494, that was actually our chart, the beginning of the rituxin story, and that was in form 2000 that established a new standard. The ECOG had looked at our CHOP versus CHOP followed by random, second randomization of maintenance. And as you can see here, the failure free survival based on maintenance was better if you had maintenance. There was no difference in the role survival, but if you started to drill down, you could see that the maintenance benefit was only in the patient who has not received the rituximab as part of the induction, making somewhat sense. So only if you, if you received the CHOP, then you had a benefit. Similarly, this was looked at as part of the GILA at the time now, the LISA, looking at the induction therapy with some form of intensive therapy followed by transplant. This was before rituximab and followed by a renovation after transplant with maintenance rituximab versus observation. And it was a clear benefit in maintenance rituximab. Again, this patient had not received uh, our chemo induction, just chemotherapy. And the FS was significantly superior, particularly in the, PRP, in the CR patients. In the CRU and PR, it did not have any impact, reflecting the fact that the response quality was not as good in those patients. The CORAL study was looking at large cell lymphoma relapse and then looking at the randomization post-transplant uh, after the salvage, uh, maintenance uh, rituximab versus observation. And the maintenance rituximab was every two months for two years versus observation. And as you can see on the left graph, there was no difference in EFS based on maintenance rituximab versus observation post auto. But if you can start to drill down and look at the outcome, in that study was quite striking. The outcome in women was, female was significantly superior comparing to male. This didn't apply in the observation arm, only in the maintenance arm. So they showed that rituximab maintenance improved the outcome in maintenance and was responsible in a coral trial for a superior outcome in women comparing to men. However, this was a city with significant toxicity in the maintenance arm and with more than 50% more AEs and in infection, not from late neutropenia in a rituximab arm, particularly in women. And therefore, this is not recommended in, in that setting. 
What about after standard therapy and our chop? So this is a study in the HD 2002 from Europe, looking at patients that had uh, induction r chop or r chop like and were randomized versus maintenance every three months for two years versus observation. And as you can see, there is no real difference in the relapse survival and overall survival, so no benefit of the maintenance. However, again, there was a benefit in male in terms of both RF, uh, relapse survival and overall survival that was significant. The NHL 13 is also a study that looked at rituximab maintenance after heart shop like chemo, and CRCRU patients were randomized every two month maintenance for one year versus observation. And there was no difference in EFS and no difference in overall survival. And once again, looking at the subset analysis, the, there was a benefit in um, male with a three years PFS of 89% in the rituximab maintenance versus 77% in, in the observation arm, and this was highly significant. So the hypothesis is that the rituximab maintenance might help equalize the difference in rituximab exposure because men have a 40% faster clearance of rituximab and potentially that could compensate for this, explaining the benefit. And the fact that women have a quote unquote slower relative clearance, have more accumulation of rituximab and potentially that explains why they have more infection in the maintenance arm. So we have learned a lot, I mean, heard a lot about the impact of gender impact on the outcome, where men have a worse outcome with heart chop in large cell lymphoma, but also the impact of rituximab and gender issues. So the, the polymorphism FC gamma was described and as a single agent in follicular lymphoma, it clearly, there was a number of polymorphism that corrected with, co correlated with a CR and a duration of response. But this was not confirmed once you combine rituximab with chemotherapy and certainly not confirmed in the R chemo setting for diffuse large cell lymphoma. This being said, that multiple studies have shown large studies in Europe that men, again, male is an adverse factor in our shop for large cell lymphoma. And again, they have a faster clearance. And several studies in Europe have looked at different scheduling, dosing to try to equalize or compensate for that and improve the um, rituximab exposure with um, paper, I mean, a rep um, series published suggesting that you can again equalize this and compensate for these poor risk features. There was a study presented at ASCO in 2016 that, tried, that looked also at the rituximab maintenance and two different schedules of rituximab in a large randomized setting, frontline for large cell lymphoma. So the, in a younger patient, they had eight cycles with two different rituximab, more or this rituximab, this one and eight in addition to the standard rituximab, versus the clinical older, so 66 to 80, they had six cycles with the same different schedule of rituximab. And the patient who had PET negative CR were randomized for maintenance rituxine every two months for two years versus observation. And there was no difference in the uh, R-CHOP arm versus the two R-CHOP arm in terms of patient characteristic. Half of the patient were um, more than 65, half at stage four and one third were bulky. There was no major difference in toxicity except some more myelotoxicity and neutropenia in older patients. But what was interesting is that the metabolic CR um, was 89 and 85 percent, so there was no difference. But when you look at the outcome, there was no difference in PFS and overall survival, regardless of the age subgroup, gender, uh, age adjusted IPI. We don't have data on a cell of origin, but here the gender had no impact. So that makes it somewhat confusing. Where do we go with that? Well, the rituximab dosing schedule is, was defined very empirically, 375 milligram per meter square. Uh, on a weekly basis and then uh, as single agent and then with every cycle of chemotherapy without CHOP. But there are some ongoing studies, particularly the optimal study that is looking at two different schedules of rituximab with an intensification. In addition, we do a second randomization with laposomal and Christine and the study is ongoing. What is difficult to conclude really firmly regarding the story of rituximab and um, sex difference in clearance and the impact is that there's many more variables. The vitamin D level, for example, a patient significantly impact the ADCC, so it, it is another factor for the activity of rituximab. The BMI also impacts the outcome of our shop. And finally, the tumor burden affects the rituximab level. So it's very difficult, on, even on large randomized series, to actually give a number variable to really make a clear conclusion of what's the impact. Moving from uh, antibodies now on a small biological, so enzastorin is actually overexpressed, I'm um, sorry, PKC beta is overexpressed 
um, in about one quarter patient with large cell lymphoma and associated with a poor outcome in that setting. So there was a large randomized trial that tried to take advantage of this and to try to give a maintenance enzastorine with a PKC beta inhibitor to try to see if we could improve the outcome of those patients. And this was in a population of high intermediate and high risk patients, CRCRU post shop and we randomized for enzastorine 500 milligram QD versus placebo for three years or until toxicity or progression. Sorry. And the results are shown here. There was no difference in DFS or overall survival. No impact on the PKC beta protein expression or the cell of origin on the outcome. And has to do with the fact that once patient achieved, uh, first of all, there's a lot of discussion on the issues on the HANS and IHC classification on the cell of origin. But also, they, once a patient achieves a CR, there doesn't seem to be as much of a difference in the outcome. Another molecule that was looked at is an mTOR inhibitor, mTOR1 inhibitor, Everolimus, that showed very promising results in combination with ARCHOP, but no benefit as maintenance. So here you can see the combination, not a big study, but combination in, um, with ARCHOP of Everolimus, and as you can see, the results are very impressive, 96% PET negative CR, and the results speak for themselves, the curve are very impressive. Again, not a large study. But when it was used in a, set, in a setting of a maintenance for the PLR2 study, which was a phase three looking at Everolimus maintenance, 10 milligram QD versus placebo after a part, um, PET negative CR, after a chop for one year or until progression of toxicity. And there was no difference again in a two years disease free survival, 78 versus 77% in a placebo arm. What about immunomodulators? So lenalidomide has shown activity in large cell lymphoma, particularly on ABC subtype, which are a more challenging subtype after ARCHOP. And this is a study that was presented at ASH by the Lisa Catherine Thiebelmont, last ASH, looking at the design where you give after ARCHOP, you give 24 maintenance of lenalidomide versus placebo. And this was for patients 60 to 80 years old, untreated diffuse large cell, essentially a few follicular 3B or transformed, and again, randomized lenalidomide versus placebo. And the primary endpoint was PFS by central review. And the median follow-up of 40 months, the median PFS was not reached for lenalidomide versus 58 months for placebo. So this was significant. So the maintenance of lenalidomide improved the PFS and decreased the risk of relapse. When you look at the subset analysis, so you can see here, this was valid in every patient. And this trial was interesting because this patient had CR or PR before they were randomized. And in addition, in spite of this, there was actually uh, still a benefit even in the PR patients and the CR patients. There was no difference on the cell origin. Another thing that was interesting in this trial is that the conversion from PR to CR, and you can see here on a stable the characteristics at the randomization for the patient in PR. So 59% had a positive PET scan in the lenalidomide among the arm, and then uh, 40, 52 in, among the PR in a placebo arm, and then the rest of it was patients who had bone marrow missing. But what was really interesting is the conversion from PR to CR during the maintenance. And it was one third of the patient PR that converted to CR in the lanidomad arm. But it was also 29% in the patient that were on the placebo arm. And I think that raised an interesting question on how we manage those patients. And they have potentially residual inflammation that actually would have been considered, there was no biopsies obviously, would have been considered potentially failure and actually could convert into CR. So something to keep in mind. And the time to conversion was about six months. What about toxicity? Not surprisingly, there was more toxicity and, and there was significant dose reduction in the lanidomide arm. And there was no difference in overall survival. And that's um, interesting because we can reduce the risk of relapse, but this patient can be salvaged. We push the relapse, so maybe they, they're a little bit easier to salvage. And this is not a very large number of uh, patients. We don't have yet the data on how they sal respond to salvage individually based on the maintenance but uh, there was no difference in overall survival. So trying to build on this, there was minilalumide plus rituximab versus uh, R-square post r -shop. So a small series, 44 patients that was presented, published in leukemia last year, diffuse large cell lymphoma, they were high-risk patient, post r -shop, and again, R-square maintenance versus uh, linalumide alone. And the two years DFS was 86%, which is promising in that context, but there was no, um, there was no difference um, by the addition of rituximab to lenalidomide. And there was no difference in the cell of origin either. 
So in summary, the maintenance in diffusal cell lymphoma has not been shown beneficial and has shown more toxicity. So this is not something that is recommended routinely. This might be an equalizer for male propionistic feature after our CHOP in diffused large cell lymphoma. And as I mentioned, there's additional large trials ongoing to try to confirm this. The biological targeted therapy, although sometimes very promising, either as a single lesion or combination with our CHOP, have not really shown clearly a benefit for enzasaurin and liverolimus. There's other um, um, small molecules that are being looked at, including bortezomib maybe non-GC post our CHOP. This is the Borma trial or ibrutinib and primary sinus lymphoma post-induction. And we heard also from John, um, ibrutinib maintenance versus, versus observation post-auto in the Alliance study. And then the immune-based therapy, I think, might be more promising than just this small molecule. One of the issues in this small molecule is that we don't necessarily have necessarily a good biomarker, and these, design, these trials are not designed based on a biomarker or rational to actually give this drug. And we select the patient very differently. Some, some studies take only the PET negative CR. Some studies take a CR and PR. So it makes it a little bit difficult to really get um, strict conclusions. But I think the immune-based therapy might be more promising. A little bit as I showed you, improve the PFS significantly. Although there was no benefit in combination of all survival, this is a signal. And maybe we can build on this. The question is that um, what is the best to combine with? And there are some ongoing studies trying to look at that. We don't have great predictors of clinical benefit. There was a presentation in Lugano of number of NK cells at baseline in that study that had a dramatic impact on the outcome overall, regardless of the maintenance. But we don't have anything specific to the maintenance on the lalumide. And then the checkpoint inhibitors that, although the story is really in hot sheen, and we heard from Barbara in T cell lymphoma and primary mediastinal, but in large cell lymphoma so far, this has not been that obvious. But uh, we are looking at actually in a study, we have a study that we're presenting at ASH, and it's a CEPI trial where we take EP nebo post auto, taking advantage of a better immunological milieu to try to see if we can prevent recurrence in the early relapse and high risk patient with large cell lymphoma. One of the questions that is really interesting is that now that we have the ability to measure molecular tumor residual burden, could we use MRD to guide maintenance ther therapies? and either by using clonal DNA or circulating tumor DNA, we know that the, we can detect before clinical recurrence, and typically the clinical recurrence, the median time to recurrence from the detection to the clinical relapse is about six months, sometimes up to two years. So potentially this is, and there are studies that will be looking at that, trying to intervene and to see if we can prevent recurrence clinical relapse. However, so far the maintenance have not in large cell lymphoma translated into a benefit in overall survival, and but have clearly reduced the risk of relapse. And I think this is an important question because we think of clinical benefit as a benefit in, re, in an overall survival. But I think we need to think also of reducing the risk of relapse and prolonging PFS in a large cell lymphoma in an elderly population that can necessarily go on a therapy and transplant might have a benefit. In addition, I would argue that in this context of all these novel therapies, and the context of value-based care with the pharmacoeconomics where we're heading probably towards bundle reimbursement and different ways of reimbursement, if we could prolong the benefit of one episode of care, potentially delaying therapy and transplant, that might be of clinical benefit and view that very differently in the context of uh, the whole cost of care. And I think that is a very exciting time. Thanks. <laughs>